Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, the, uh, the guideline project here. Um, and I think, uh, as an introductory remark, I think usually it's a very boring topic, which I hate to give as a lecture because it's uh, citing uh, regulatory relevant stuff. Uh, I'm more excited about science. However, um, if we, I would say, if we didn't have these guidelines, maybe progress in CLL wouldn't have been so fast because it gives a framework where we can, where we can develop treatments and uh, therefore I think it's important. Um, the, um, these are my disclosures. So first of all, let me um, give you two reasons why we thought, this is moving a bit too fast, um, why we thought we should revise the guidelines. First of all, there was tremendous uh, new data and knowledge about the genomic landscape and we just heard again at this meeting some of the data that have uh, inspired us so much and also we had new therapeutics, lots of them over the last 10 years. So this is one of the many representations of genomic aberrations in CLL. We are now starting to understand which of the central pathways are leading to different forms of CLL uh, and we are, have learned over the last 10 years that the B-cell receptor signaling is certainly important and downstream there are many mutations found that can make this disease uh, more aggressive and also as soon as it comes to the DNA damage uh, control and he, there are alterations in this field, as you can see here, then the disease becomes much more aggressive. This slide you've seen in the last fascinating lecture by Dan Landau and um, what we can derive from this is that eventually we have to learn how to prevent the clonal evolution. We don't really understand which steps are coming at which time point, but uh, the initial um, lesions are not all very aggressive and uh, if we could design better treatments that would prevent clonal evolution into more aggressive disease in CLL, we would certainly create large benefit for our patients and so therefore uh, the novel treatment generation should be designed to be able to control this uh, disease and therefore parts of the guidelines have designed also with this thought in mind. So very quickly, future therapeutic strategies should try to prevent clonal evolution by smart combinations. So all the drugs that you've heard today um, in the future, I think, will be combined. Single agent therapy will probably not be the rule, it will be the exception. And so if you look at CLL as the imbalance between cell survival signaling driven by the B cell receptor, toll-like receptors and others leading to the activation of nf -kappa b and then on the other side of the balance, uh, the apoptotic machinery that is uh, needed to shut off B cells and is dysregulated, uh, then we now can modify these two pathways by targeted inhibitors, just like ibrutinib, idelalisib, or also venetoclax, and shift this balance uh, and correct one of the essential defects in CLL. Now, in order to do that in combinations, we've designed a couple of years ago already a structure that after Dan Landau's talk makes sense because we, by debulking, reduce the clonal repertoire of CLL by simply um, actually reducing the heterogeneity of the, all the clones and then go into targeted combinations uh, followed by an MRD tailored maintenance. So as soon as we are MRD negative, we stop. If there is residual disease, we combine or we continue with agents that are listed here and this is getting to a more targeted, more efficient treatment eventually. I just show you two sets of data. Uh, this is from the uh, CLL BIC protocol that just exactly employing the strategy but using bendamustin, omenituzumab and um, ibrutinib in a sequence and uh, the results have been presented and are currently submitted showing you fairly encouraging data with an overall response rate of 100% both in the first line and in the relapsed refractory setting. Uh, so that this is one example how we may move forward. And finally, maybe even more interesting, the data from the BAC protocol, which is combining venetoclax and GO101 followed with by a bendamustin debulking step. And again, you see here, response rates that are close to 100%, both in the refractory relapse setting and in the, um, and in the first line patients. First line is 100%. But more important and more interesting, the MRD negative responses obtained in both 
treatment eve and refractory patients are close to 90 percent, 91 percent in the first line setting. So we think that with this very potent sequential and combination strategy, you may eventually avoid clonal evolution by simply preventing the onset of this outgrowth of, uh, of these uh, nasty clones that can come. And this is what we should aim at in the future. So do we have the framework to do so? Um, I think this is just one thing where we actually finished a study on the unfit population, treating them with a combination of Netoclux plus uh, uh, G101. And you can see from this data very quickly uh, that uh, they respond within days uh, with a clearance of the blood by the combination of the drugs. And after one year, they are again more than 91%, more than 90% MOD negative. So it looks as we are achieving substantial progress towards getting MOD negative disease. And uh, this is the lymphadenopathy in the same setting. Uh, so all the patients do respond beautifully, most of them with a complete disappearance of all lymph nodes. So in summary, I think uh, the progress in the field now is going into deeper remissions with shorter lasting treatments and the future trials as the examples that I've shown you are probably aiming to control, if not avoid, tar clonal evolution in CLL. Now, since we have this development, the guidelines set the framework to do this development. The paper um, has been submitted in the first half of this year and we got the reviews back just recently um, and uh, there is more than 150 different comments, but all of them very, very helpful and constructive, but I have to work my, my way through all these 150 comments to resubmit the paper. What were the principles for the revision of these guidelines? So first of all, we wanted to change as little as possible to facilitate comparison with historic clinical trials. We wanted to eliminate a number of inconsistencies of the former paper and to incorporate numerous innovations or to at least make statements about them. The first one is an important one because we have not changed anything. Uh, so you could say, well, you could even argue from what I said now, um, should we eventually treat CLL earlier because we have now these potent drugs and uh, the panel has decided to remain, to have unchanged treatment indications because we have no formal proof that early stage treatment is changing the outcome yet. And therefore, uh, in general practice, treatment of early stage disease is not recommended. Prognostic factors. In a, since you've seen the genetic data presented at the meeting, you could say, well, we have probably a thousand prognostic factors for CLL. Which ones are we needing? That's actually the key question. So we maintain the knowledge that the BNA staging or RI staging are convenient to stratify patients. Additional markers that are helpful, the four most established ones, I would say, are IGVH mutational status, beta 2 microglobulin, the presence of TP53 aberrations, deletion 17P or mutations, and eventually complex karyotype. There have been several scores constructed to reduce the knowledge, the plethora of prognostic factors into simple prognostic tools, and I think they deserve uh, prospective validation. The panel has decided that they need to be further analyzed. I show you one which we have developed with US, European, and uh, Eastern European investigators that has these four factors plus H, and it's a weighted score where you have four groups of uh, prognostic uh, impact here, um, shown here, and they separate extremely nicely over all clinical stages. You can see the same graph in stage uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, um, four different groups. Um, in the era of chemoimmunotherapy and also it has been shown recently uh, in the treatment with kinase inhibitors, although these data need to be mature. It, uh, this is a meta-analysis recently accepted at the blood journal showing that the Clippy is very powerful. And what it does is allows you to reduce the number of clinically meaningful prognostic factors to some essential variables and then design novel treatments. So one group of patients that needs better treatment here is clearly this one and we wanted to actually carve out one group of patients where we can measure progress, and that's the high-risk population, because with chemoimmunotherapy, 
uh, usually you didn't, could not improve because the median survival with uh, FCR, for example, median PFS is around seven years, so difficult to improve. This score allows you to select populations where you can um, improve, and it reduces the plethora of prognostic factors to five essential factors. One statement uh, we had to do is second-line treatment indications. So the guidelines do not give recommendations on the treatment itself. It's not the purpose, but when to initiate. So disease relapse by itself, like a lymphocyte increase, is not a criterion to restart therapy unless the disease is progressive and symptomatic, an important statement. So lymphocyte counts are not an indication. Second-line treatment decisions in essence follow the same indications as uh, those for first-line uh, treatment, so basically symptomatic disease needs to be treated. And uh, there are some clearly definable groups of patients where, uh, where we think non-chemotherapy regimens should be used, and that's resistant disease. Then if you have a very short time to progression after first chemoimmunotherapy of only two years, and leukemia, with deletion 17P or TP53. Those are clearly patients where treatments should not, be, um, co should not contain any chemotherapy component anymore because we have all the novel agents and here's a clear recommendations to be given. Uh, the one big question that has not been discussed uh, by at large at this, at this meeting is when to initiate allogeneic stem cell transplantation and I think that's now for only selected cases in second or even third line uh, with uh, with uh, high risk genetic features. What is the definition? So the guidelines were originally designed um, several decades ago, ago to define response criteria uh, in treatment trials. So the major task uh, is uh, still to give guidance when and how to assess responses and uh, relapses. There was one problem and that is with continuous therapies uh, we have now to evaluate a response and do not stop it anymore because uh, we continue, for example, ibrutinib in trials. And therefore, we had a couple to, to, to make a couple of refinements of the guidance. So the timing of response assessment with a defined treatment duration should be at least two months after the completion of therapy for those treatments that we stop. For continued therapies, so the ones that we currently use with kinase inhibitors, we um, formulate the assessment of response should be performed at least two months after the patient achieves its maximal response. So you have a stable situation where no further improvement is seen, um, as we have seen it f in very old times with chlorambucil. You treat it until maximal response, and then you assess the response. That's exactly the situation here. And um, it should be sustained for at least two months to really give us uh, certainty in your judgment. A further problem was um, the um, assessment of responses with uh, minimal residual disease, so that should be done two months after uh, you declare complete remission or uh, declare the maximal response being achieved. Um, then we tried, and I will make this extremely short, to harmonize the uh, assessment of lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly uh, with the guidelines on lymphoma, so CLL is not a lymphoma entity, um, so most of your, your assessment can be done with lymphocyte counts, but um, the measurements have been harmonized with the uh, Chesson uh, publication of the JCO2014. Uh, and it is important to stress that in CLL some things have evolved a little differently than in lymphoma because we have data, this is a publication uh, that recently was published in uh, the JCO, showing you that uh, if you achieve an MOD negative response here in blue, for example, um, and that can be a PR or a CR, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the MOD could be and seems to be the more potent parameter in terms of the reliability and also the quality of the response compared to, for example, splenomegaly. Patients with a splenomegaly and an MOD negative response are doing extremely well, as you can see here, for example, in gray. And therefore, we think that uh, the imaging has only a relative contribution to the assessment in CLL um, as compared to the molecular assessment by MRD. Then we had to address the issue of transient lymphocytosis because we have now these inhibitors that cause a transient disease 
I wouldn't call it progression, lymphocytosis, and therefore we had to clarify that these transient increases of uh, lymphocytes are not a sign of treatment failure or progressive disease. We already uh, clarified this in an e-publication uh, some years ago, and this is now incorporated into the guidelines. MRD, um, the techniques, and you have heard this this morning by Pete Hillman's talk, are now fairly standard. There are several technologies, and they can both be used for color flow cytometry or more color. Any, any um, MRD um, by four color or more color flow cytometry can be used, or PCR-based technologies. And the definition is uh, more than one, less than one cell in 10,000 leukocytes. The blood is generally um, usable for this assessment. For some um, trials or studies where you use monoclonal antibodies, you may wish to confirm the depth of response by bone marrow aspirates. And uh, they should always be reported MRD data on an intent to treat basis and not just on the numbers of CRs to not overestimate the impact of MRD assessments. <clears throat> Shortly, factors requiring stratification and inclusion in clinical trials. So basically, previous treatment versus no treatment. We still kept the prurin analog sensitive versus refractory uh, in the studies, uh, clinical stage. And then the most important um, genomic or genetic deletions that have poor prognosis, deletion 17P, deletion 11Q, and mutations of the TP53 gene, the IGVH mutational status, and those are the major factors uh, that we think should be investigated. So in conclusion, the major points of the 2017 guidelines, we also um, are proud to say that some things have not changed. Treatment indications remain unchanged despite novel agents. So do not, we think we should not treat patients earlier um, than before, and they should only be treated if they are symptomatic. The prognostic factors that have now been consolidated in numerous prospective trials are those listed here. Complex karyotype is a bit of a novel entity, but it has com particular implications uh, when using kinase inhibitors, and therefore it was included in the guidelines as one parameter to consider. The use of scores, uh, the CLIPI is encouraged in clinical trials. We have been encouraged by the reviewers to stress this point a bit more because the CLIPI has now been validated by several trials and we need to discuss this when resubmitting the publication. And finally, the response assessment. We have clarified that you can, of course, assess the response under continued therapies. Uh, you cannot imagine what regulators can think about these things, but they sometimes requested to stop uh, kinase inhibitor treatment just to assess the response, which is, uh, from a clinical perspective, complete nonsense, and therefore we had to clarify this in the guidelines. Lymphocytosis, as you know, is not uniformly a sign of progression. Actually, we can even use it in our patients with kinase inhibitors to clearly make the statement that patients respond and react to uh, ibrutinib or idolatacib and we have emphasized the increasing value of MRD as an endpoint. So with this, I'm actually at the end and happy to take any question. Thank you very much.